You are listening to The New Man, Beyond the Macho Jerk and the New Age Wimp. Your host is men's coach, Trip Lemire. Do you feel alive or do you spend most of your time just existing? Could you be wasting time and energy on the stuff that just doesn't matter? And would you live your life differently after facing your own death? I don't want to spoil anything about the story you're about to hear, but let's just say Dave Baker has a pretty amazing tale to tell. He has spent his life being highly active, both as a competitive athlete as well as a lifeguard with the Wrightsville Beach Ocean Rescue Program. 11 years ago, he should have died, but obviously he didn't. And today, we're going to talk about what happened and how this event has shaped the way he chooses to live. You got any questions for me? Or is there anything you want to make sure we address before? No, man. We get going. This is your gig. Yeah, this you know? is my gig. I, I, I this, this is your gig. This, this is what I do. This isn't. Mine's just you know showing up as they get, say. Well, it's, it's me too. And, I just and, get to and, talk to people. Yeah, and so. mine is to sit on my ass all day and maybe work <laughs> five minutes out of a day. You know, that's about it. Well, that that five minutes out of the day might be pretty hairy. That five minutes is what I like to tell people is that if we had a 40 hour work week, we basically do nothing for 39 hours and 55 minutes, but it's the five minutes no one else wants to do is what we do. Yeah. So, yeah. I, I think I ran into you. I was, I was coming out of the water one day and I think I asked you something like, how's things going? We're pretty good. We got some new, I think you had a new batch of of guards that were working and, and like somebody had died that first day and they were like, I don't know if you remember what oh, had happened. Oh yeah, it was, uh, we had a rookie guard and, uh, no, the person didn't die, but okay. they were all general purposes. They weren't breathing. Okay. And first day, uh, first, first day they jumped down, recognize it. Started CPR, rescue breasts. The cavalry's coming. She called it in like she's supposed to. Cavalry's coming. We're all showing up. And, you know, kid came back, 10-year-old kid. You know, transported wow. him off. No. He walked out of the hospital. That's amazing. And everything neurologically intact. Everything was great. So first day on the job though, first day on the job, <laughs> rookie guard. And, uh, you know, it just shows that, uh, the training works. How long you been, how long you been doing the ocean rescue thing? Ocean rescue here since, uh, November of Oh four came from the outer banks. And prior to that, um, I was in, uh, South Florida. So I, started lifeguarding back in 1977. Wow. You've been at it a while. I I tried the real world <laughs> for a little bit. You mean you want to go found, to the beach every day? And, and I found that flip-flops, t-shirts, and board shorts wins out over shoes that you have to learn how to tie it's yeah. you know and then i always uh, feel like if i'm wearing pants maybe something's wrong like something yeah something's absolutely <laughs> it's like oh man these don't tie you got a button you got uh, a zipper you gotta wear is, a belt not good something's up yeah this is wrong something's up yeah this is wrong. <laughs> i made a bad choice somewhere <laughs> that's right and you have to button a shirt you don't pull it over your head so you've always been fit. You've always been training. You've always, I mean, you were in, you were in triathlons for a while. Like what are some of the things that you've been, geez, you've you been know, I, so I was running a lot. Then I got into cycling and I really enjoyed that. And then triathlons came along. That works because you've been swimming, the cycling works, the running works. Right. And it's a, it's a great combination for, for lifeguards. All right. Well, let's get into it. So there was one particular race. Yeah, in um, it was, uh, a, called a super sprint at uh, up in Topsail, Surf City. Yeah, uh, this was in um, late May of 07. Okay, and uh, I've been training, and I was like, going, all right, this is going to be great because it's it's a swim, and that's the only time you swim. But then you do a quick sprint, then you do a bicycle. 
then you do another sprint, then you do a bicycle and then you do a run and then it's over. Okay. How old are you at this time? Uh, at that time I was 49. Okay. 49 years old doing these 49. Things. Yeah. Right. And so there I go, get out of the water, have a, a really good swim. And I'm running from the, where you get out to, it, to the bike, jump on the bike, start going and just feeling just like, ah, oh, man, I'm overtrained. I'm really feeling a little crappy right now. This is really sucks. A little crappy. A little crappy. <laughs> yeah. I was just like, there's no, no gas. I, I'm trying to push the pedal and there's no gas coming out. Okay. But I'm keep on going. And then um, you jump out and, you, and after you do that quick uh, bike ride, you have to do like a mile and a half run. And it's, it's a sprint. So you're running and I'm going like, Man, where's that extra gear? Yeah. It's it's just not there. Yeah. So uh some buddies, um, I I remember um they work at the fire department, they're watching go, they're going, yeah, go, go, go. And I'm just going, hey, ain't nothing going, uh, you know? And so then I get back to the transition, back on the bike. Riding and I'm just going like, all right, this is this is it. It's, so you're not in pain, but you're just out of gas. I'm just there's not that second gear. I'm going, but there's nothing in the tank. Huh. It's like, all right, um, maybe I'm getting sick. Maybe I'm overtrained. Right. So I'm I'm doing that last uh, bike, and I'm coming into the transition, and I just said. And I have never DNF, which is did not finish. Right. And I'm just like going, all right, I'm not doing the last run. That I'm, had to be I'm, a big decision. It was, it was just one of those things back in my head. I'm just, I'm too tired. Yeah. I, it's, it was just really weird. Yeah. But I couldn't put my finger on it. Ah. So I said, all right, calling it a day, put my bike up, grabbed my stuff, watched everybody finish, yelled, cheered, picked my stuff up. You're started still standing lo- around and you're still just- Still standing around, okay. everything like that. <laughs> I remember in the back of my head, ah, lay down, lay down. I heard this little voice and uh-huh. I was going like, nah, you're not that tired, just, just- Go ahead, bow, put your stuff up, get in a car, go on home. Yeah. So on the way home, I'm just like going, man, that really sucked. What's going on? Yeah. But in the back of my mind, I was just like, this is weird. I went for a checkup a week later. Okay. So the whole week, you're, you're the still whole just, week, just, I'm just sucking like, gas. Just, I'm, I'm just running slow. Yeah. Um, everything's slow. In fact, I did that race on, um, it was a Saturday. Monday, we had a seven mile run with the lifeguards in the sand. Yeah. So I did the seven mile run with them. Okay. You did a seven mile run in the sand after not finishing the triathlon and you're out of gas and you're like, yeah, let me go run seven miles in the sand. Right. Okay. So did the seven mile run and I'm going like, golly, okay, you know, it's fine, but it's just not there. Yeah. It, it's like, so I'm going, ah, oh, wonder what's going on. Decide to, to go to a doctor, get a checkup. And long story short, nothing there. And I was, had a friend and he had just built a house for this cardiologist. And I just go, Hey man, um, you think you can, you know, make a phone call and, you know, just, you had some intuition that something was off and, and he goes, ah, just call. They're, they're, they're cool. He's really, really cool. He's an athlete. He does triathlons. He surfs. He lives right. on the beach. This guy's great. You need to go. Okay. Uh, and I said, all right. So everything said and done. Two and a half weeks after the race, I get in to the cardiologist. And he goes, hey, what's going on? Da, da, da. And he says, let's, let's hook you up. Let's go ahead and do an EKG and right. everything like that. And uh, 
He says, my, my technicians will do that. I'll be back in a little bit. I said, all right, cool. Well, they do it, hook me up, do a 12 lead and, uh, everything's quiet. And I'm just sitting there. He walks in, sits down. He's sitting there. He's looking at the strip. He's looking at me. He's looking at the strip. Then he looks at me and he goes, what are you doing at three? I go, why? What's going on? He says, you have had a massive heart attack. And it was just dead quiet. I was going like, no way. Little did I know. And he's going like, you know, we need to get there. I'm going, yeah, let me go home, get some stuff. You know, I'll, I'll meet you. I'll get there and everything. Well, what had happened is my left anterior descending artery at that time was 100% blocked, commonly called the Widowmaker. Okay. All this time from that race, backtracking, hindsight, and everything, it happened during the race. So two and a half weeks, I went with this fully blocked artery. Okay. Think of it this way. Take a rubber band, wrap it around your finger as tight as you can, and let's just leave it there. For two and a half weeks. For two and a half weeks. Yeah. That's what happened. The The bottom portion of my heart um, was totally destroyed. Um, How did you not die? I, I, that's the it, part it, I don't understand. Th- Life garden. All of that training over all these years, all of that running, all of that cycling, all of those little things where you're paddling provided enough collateral blood flow to keep my heart going. So essentially, is it half of your heart that died from that heart attack? Well, it's the bottom left portion. And, okay. and, and the way There's it four goes chambers. Is, yeah, and it's not really like half of it died, but you have a thing called your ejection fraction. And after everything was said and done and the life-saving operation, they um, checked my ejection fraction. And that's how much blood you, you know, pump out on each time it, it squeezes. Right. Normal people sitting around, um, you know, even athletes, you're somewhere between 70 to 75 on your ejection fraction. Got to leave a little bit of blood there in the, yeah. the chamber so it goes ahead. So it's like keeping the pump primed. Yeah. On a good day at that time, I was 32%. Okay. So I was, my heart was working at half of what. Okay. So you had half the capacity, a quarter of your heart basically was shut down and yet you, had, you right. still had a half of the. Yeah. And when you look at the, the echoes that we did, the whole bottom left doesn't move. Everything else squeezes and that just hangs there. And you didn't have any of the telltale signs of like the numbing in the left. All, all the stuff you, we're told you know, to look for. All I had was a little bit of tightness in chest and that's what I was thinking was being overtrained. So, and once again, this is all hindsight when you, you know, find all these things and you start going, oh, oh, that two and a half weeks, you know, that was, that's some bad stuff. Yeah. And I was like going, you know, I was kicking myself. I was going, shit, why couldn't I have been like 99%? Then I still would have had 1% of blood going there and it wouldn't have died off. Right, right. You know? Take so, me back to that moment where you're sitting there and he says, you've had a massive heart attack. Because here you are, you're this fit, really strong guy. I imagine heart attack wasn't even on your radar. It'd be one thing if you're like, yeah, I'm, you know, I go through the drive through know, every the, morning. The and- thing of it is, I didn't can't really put into words the... It was just more numb like Mm -hmm. really you just want to look at really 
You sure you got the right y- y- yeah, it's like, sure, yeah, you know, and then I'm going like, yeah, that's really stupid to ask him. Or really? It's like when someone talks to us and you go, is that a rip current? And you say, yeah, that's a rip current. You know, and then they go, really? really? I'm going, no, I'm just making this up. <laughs> Good job, so yeah, it's uh, just one of those moments in life where you're going, all right, what are we going to do? Yeah. So after... So what they do at three? What was the surgery they put you guys uh, in? That at three, they went ahead and, and put a stent in. They opened up that block artery. And what's really cool about this, I thought it was cool. You're totally awake. You're sitting there. You're watching the, the TV that they're watching. You're conscious. You're conscious. And you see the little wire goes up in there. And they're tickling your heart and blowing it up and putting this the you know the the stint in and um and you're watching this this whole time did you feel anything in no your you own? don't feel could not mean but did you feel your body like get more energy back in that moment as the as no blood stuff? The, it you know at that time it just i was just like all, all right this is hap-. it's like watching a tv show but you're, you're really the person right in it this is really me. This is really my heart. This is really yeah, happening. I woke up this really morning. People with wires running up through my leg, my femoral artery, all the way up to my heart to 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 open this blockage. Wow. Okay. You know. So they did that operation. Went great. Um, then you go into uh, cardiac recovery and everything. And I remember this. This was like one of those. Okay, that's that's that kind of hurt is they, the, there's more or less, I uh, forget what it's called, kind of like a sleeve they stick up your femoral artery. So you don't bleed out while they're going ahead and um, running the wires up. And it mm-hmm. has kind of like little baffles on it and, okay. and everything like that. And they had to take that out. Okay. And they said, this may hurt a little bit. <laughs> I was going like, okay. And they take and they they pull it a little bit, and then they wrap their hand around that Ooh. again, and then pull some more. Ah. And it's like, <laughs> <laughs> you know. <laughs> and then they have to lean on that femoral artery all their weight, so you don't bleed out until it clots. And then they put like 10, 15 pound sandbags on that. And you sleep like that to make sure everything clots up. Wow. Yeah. But when they pulled that out, that was like, yeah, okay. That was, that was different. That was different. That was different. Okay. Yeah. All right. So you get out of the surgery and then what's life like? What are they telling you? Like they're basically, cause yeah. What are they telling you after you have this surgery? Uh, all right. That's one of those things you, you just go home and you're trying to process. Yeah. And then they get you into to cardiac rehab. Okay. Cardiac rehab is just a phenomenal, the people are just great. And, um, but the, the story is you, they, they do an evaluation on you and, uh, they said, okay, let's, let's, let's go walk the hall. Let's, yeah. let's see how far you can go and everything. I could only go 200 yards before getting out of breath. Totally just like wiped out. Post-op. This is post-op, everything. Less and they're, they're doing evaluations. Okay. And they go, okay. And they, they start everything. And I talked to the cardiologist and to the cardiac rehab people. And I said, I don't want to be a mall walker. Mm-hmm. That is not my goal. You what did have, you mean by that? I know that uh, I know that you don't want to. But what are you saying? I want to get back to. I want to get back. In the ocean. I want to get back to a, a life that I feel is conducive to my lifestyle. I don't want to be a burden. I don't want to mentally have the burden of like all I can do is walk. Mm-hmm. All I can do is go to the mall and walk. Mm-hmm. You know, that's about it. I'll never run again. I'll never cycle. I'll so never even though your anything. life had been saved, there was still a part of like, it's not, I'm not going to say not worth living, but you were really clear that if life for you was going to be 
I'm going to be strong again. I'm not going to just get by. Uh, mine was quality of life, and I am not going to let them put limitations on me mm -hmm. because I didn't know what limitations should be. I, I'm going into this blind, and I think that was a good thing. Is but if I had read, well, you can only do this if you had this much, you know, damage and everything like that. That would have been my benchmark. My benchmark was unknown. You had no expectations. I had. I wasn't going to let my expectations to be low. Mm -hmm. I was setting my expectations to what I could do. And no one knew what that was except until I reached them. Right. So I said, okay. Um, and in this, you have, uh, you, you go for six weeks. Okay. Mm -hmm. I said, all right. They, they said, what's your goal? Uh, my goal. I said, I want to be able to uh, run a 5K by the time I get out of here. And they said, uh, that's a little ambitious. And I was going, yeah, well, you know, <laughs> I want to be able to run a 5K, which is 3.1. Um, and uh, that's that's what I want to do. Yeah. I, I just don't want to walk. I, I would get on the treadmill and I would... I would sweat, I would everything, and I watch all these other people, and they're living the life of what they think it, life should be. And right. I'm going, no, this is my life. I'm going to do it this way. Yeah. And there were parameters they put on me. They, I was hooked up to EKG uh, leads and everything, and they would monitor you, make sure you wouldn't throw any weird, you know, PVC, you know, weird electrical activity of your heart, right. you know, like you were going to kill yourself. I said, okay, that's cool. You know, that's your job. My they job. let you run or I mean, yeah. let you kind of yeah. ex ex and, and, extend yourself. And I made sure that with uh, my cardiologist, he wrote on my orders to them, let him go. Mm. Let him, you know, here's your parameters, do your job, but let him do his job. There, It's, it's an open book. Okay. So three weeks into it, I, I do my 5K. Three weeks after, three weeks in the rehab, you're six, five and a half, six weeks out from yeah from your from your heart attack. You you run a you run a 5K. Run a 5K. Okay. So I was going like, all right, this is good. Mm -hmm. And so I keep on working, keep on working, doing what I'm supposed to do. Uh, last day. I looked at um, the uh, exercise physiologist there and I said, I'm running a 10 K I'm going to do it under an hour, you know? So, you know, to, that puts you in a nine minute, you know, nine thirty something pace mm -hmm. and everything like that. And he says, okay, all right. You know, we'll watch you. And so I just started running, you know, I did a forest gump. I just ran <laughs> and I did it. I did my 10 K in like 58, 42. I still have the printout. I, from the, the exercise fizz, I got it in a book, yeah. you know? So I did, I, I went there my last day. I finished up. I did a 10 K. What did that mean to you? Cause I, you know, on one level there's the process, right? I love to run. So I go run, but it sounded for you, it sounded like running this 10 K and running it under a certain time meant something. So what did it mean to you? What did it say to you about yourself or, or about what your state of your life? It said that my, I could live the quality of life that I was looking to do. I wasn't going just to exist but I was going to be able to do things that athletically that I'm going, okay, I'm not going to be as fast. I can live with that. Mm -hmm. Yes. There's parameters that there you put on me. I can live with that, but I'm not just walking in the mall. Mm -hmm. And that would mean, what does that mean to you? If, if, if we were to see Dave Baker, Hey, I haven't seen you in a while. And, and we see you walk in the mall. What is that? What did that story? What does that say about you? If you're just walking the mall for you, to, to me, it means that I'm like everybody else. And, and that I listen to what the statistics say and that I know that I should be happy that this is your life. 
Well, that's not my life. My life is being outdoors, being active mm. and doing things. And that the, when I did that 10 K, it was the sense of accomplish, accomplishment that I did this in six weeks. Mm -hmm. What am I going to do later on? Was that a big driver of the, when you said I was like everybody else, that's a, that's a big driver for a lot of people to not be lost in the crowd, to not just be another face in the crowd to not just be another herd follower, so to speak. And that could be another form of death, right? We feel that when we lose our identity, um, is that a big thing that drives you in, in your athletics and your, in your endeavors in that way to like, this is where I, I exist. Is that a part of I, it? I think, um, it, it does athletics and, and being out there. Mm -hmm. I'm no longer the fastest or anything like that, but at the, you know, over the years and everything, it's just such an intricate part of me. Mm -hmm. I grew up in a family that was athletic. Mm -hmm. My father was running ultras before ultras were cool. Mm -hmm. He's run from the Mississippi to the Jersey boardwalk. He used to do 24 hour races, runs. Right. He used to cycle. He would cycle across states. He would do all these things. My mom even ran when we were growing up in South Florida. So this is who we are. This is right? this is what we did. Yeah. yeah. You know, it this was where, this a, is how a I grew family up. that always was moving forward and challenging themselves. And it's not against other people, but challenging yourself. Yeah. I get that. that because there's a piece of, if, you, if we were to take that away, then it's like, well, then who am I? Who am I if I'm not able to go out and move my body in the way that I want? Like that, you've, you've taken away like this lineage that I'm a part of. I don't get to do that anymore. And, and being a mall walker means that's not me. That's not who I am. Right. And, you know, and I was trying to figure out, all right, what am I going to do during this time? Like if I couldn't get to that, uh, 5k or anything. I was going like, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? How am I going to challenge myself? And I was going, well, shit, you know, if I'm going to walk and that's all I can do, I'll be the best damn golfer there is. <laughs> <laughs> I'll pull my own bags. I'll walk courses, but I will play golf. Okay. You know, I was already I'm just trying not, to come Whatever up, I'm going to do, I'm not going to sit still is I'm what I'm not getting. going to sit still. Yeah. Like that's where the death is, is like being somebody who just sits still. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, after rehab, um, I was going like, all right, next challenge, next challenge. So that's six weeks, eight months from the, on from my heart attack. Mm. It's going, what am I going to do? Oh, well, hey, there's a half marathon coming up. So I decided to go run a half marathon. Your doc's cool with all this. Yeah. He gave me parameters. He says, you know, it's your life. And during this time, they were wanting to put an internal cardiac defibrillator in me. Yeah. And uh, which is for sudden cardiac death. In other words, you it's to save your life. Mm -hmm. um, and I said, no. Why? And they, cause it, and they kept going, but your ejection fraction is so low. You're so low. This will, you know, this will save your life. I was going, no. Why not? This is too early. My mind hasn't wrapped around what has even happened to me. Okay. And you're telling me you want to do this and I'm going to have another setback. It's not going to happen. This is not the quality of life I want. And you just, you, you didn't get that they were trying to save your life. You just saw it as another physical, something that would slow you down physically. Is that what it was? I, I saw it as a, it mentally, I couldn't handle it. Was it the best thing for me at the time? In their minds, yes. But as they say, wait for the rest of the story, mm. you know? So... I just said, no. And they kept going, well, and they said, it's your choice. I go, all right, no big deal. It's my choice. Mentally, I don't want the setback. I don't know if I can handle it. Everything's going fine for me. Let's continue. Mm -hmm. So eight months out, go ahead and run a half marathon. My goal was to do it under two hours. 
And I did. I came in like 158. That 58 has, <laughs> seems to work well. Mm -hmm. And then um, after that, um, there was a um, half Ironman I wanted to do. So that was about at 11 months. So I said, all right. So I did a half Ironman, which is 1.2 swim, 50 six on the bike and then an, uh, a half uh, marathon did that finished great fine did fun then one year one day i went back to the same race that i had the heart attack that was the most difficult thing to stand there at that starting line, the monkey, let me rephrase that. The gorilla mm. on my back was huge. The emotions were just, I, I, I still to this day, and we're talking 11 years later, I can't explain it. But I did the race, great swim. Everything was going fine. I was on the last run. I was in first place for my division and everything. And the Walking Dead division, like this. <laughs> <laughs> Literally, I, I, you know, it was like I was having a phenomenal race. I was having the race I should have had the year before. Yeah, and I was a half mile from the finish. And, um, the guy that actually beat me passed me. And there was a part of me that says, Serge, you got this. And another part that said, that's okay. He hasn't gone through what you have and you don't want to wind back up where you were. Mm. So I, I just said, I just kind of kept my own race let him let him go and it taught me right then and there life was back to normal a year later you were you were actually one, competing one to win. year one day not like oh, I, I finished right everybody stand around at midnight and they drag me across the line no. it's i was competing to i was win. competing and i wound up on the podium so i went from nearly dead to on the podium in one year nuts it's the power of knowing that you can succeed don't let other people tell you what your limitations are define your own well, let me ask you about that because where was death in your mind as you were pushing yourself right it, it obviously if people are you know Hey, maybe you should put a defibrillator in or you should do some of these things. Where, where was your relationship with your own mortality during this time? That's a really good question in that I th think it was the ability to sit back and accept that we all have a limited amount of time on this earth. And you choose how to use your time. And that I wanted to be a participant in life and not a spectator to it. And I was comfortable with that mortality bit in knowing that I was doing something that makes me happy. And since then and other things, I've, I've talked to people and even while um, I'm paddling and doing things is that um, I've told them if I die do, while I'm doing this, because I do have major heart disease, I do have major damage, you know, every day is a gift. Don't be sad in that 
you know, you can be sad that I'm gone, but realize I'm doing exactly what I want to do. How many other people get that opportunity to enjoy something like that? Like if I'm paddling and I happen to have the big one and die, I'm doing something that I thoroughly enjoy and love. I'm, I'm outdoors. It's, you know, Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm doing something that drives me and, and inspires me to, to do things because it's just such a, a wonderful thing to be able to do, whether you're running, you're, you're cycling, you're paddling. Um, it's, it's, a it's a gift, you know, why should you squander that, that gift? And that, um, you know, you, you die, you die. I could, you can get in your car and you could die right. tragically that way, mm-hmm. but I'm doing something I love. So I looked at, I need to embrace each day. I need to try to be a better person each day. Mm-hmm. Do I succeed? No, I feel like everybody else, you know, some days are worse than others yeah. and everything. But I, th- I think about it. I am a fanatic about watching sunrises. You can go to my Instagram and it's all sunrises. <laughs> like I, I got another one, right? Like I got another day, right? <laughs> yeah. I, and, and to the point of I have a panorama that's eight foot long and two and a half feet high of a sunrise that's on the wall at the base of the bed. So no matter what, I wake up, I have a sunrise every day. What's it mean to you to see a sunrise? It's the beginning of a new day and you choose how to, you know, it's, you choose how it's going to go. You can't, things are going to happen, yeah. but you have the ability to control how you deal with whatever happens. Yeah. You can get upset or you go, eh, oh, well, you know. Well, the thing that sticks out to me is that, you know, there's this there's this thing where we are physically alive. Maybe we're walking the mall, right? But that's not the, that's not the, in from your perspective, the act of living, right? That, that we can be just getting by, we can be surviving, but then there's being alive, there's living our lives and that you've been really clear to take a stand for living your life, not just existing, not just getting by. Right. And, and since that time, just, I, I have challenged myself every year. Um, like, what am I going to do? How am I, how am I going to feel alive? Where do you find this in, in, is, is this consistent in all areas of your life? I know for me, I can really excel in, one area and then it's like over here, I'm not so good at, at, at bringing those places where I, I can be so courageous. Is, is there a, it's easy to put you on a pedestal here and, and admire you for what you've done physically and, and like the, the, where you feel really comfortable in these races. Is there a place where you're like, man, I'd like, but I'd like to be able to bring this over into this part of my life too. Uh, you know, I think everybody's like that. Yeah, um, for sure. There's life is hard and you know relationships are are difficult they're hard you have to work on them and in finding people that are willing to discuss and talk openly mm-hmm. and and communicate um is is really what it takes yeah but genuinely to find people that genuinely will tell you exactly how they feel and not sugarcoat it. That's difficult. And that's difficult for people because a lot of people don't want to hurt someone, but it still hurts the individual because they're not being a hundred percent open. It's the short term. I'll avoid any kind of discomfort here in the moment, but it it, it acts like a cancer in the relationship, which is like, I can't really trust this person to, they'll only be my friend up until a certain point. And then they're not really going to be my friend. They're not, they don't really have my back because they're not willing to go into a place where it might be uncomfortable. So, you know, the me, I am truly a, an introvert. Mm -hmm. I love my quiet time. Yeah. I can handle two, three people that I know. 
I'm good with that. I'm very comfortable. You tell me to go to a party and just show up. Me too. <laughs> shoot me. <laughs> that is beyond. But you're a pretty popular guy around here. Everybody... But the thing of it is, everyone wants to talk about stuff I really don't care. I leave work at work. Yeah. I don't. I don't yeah, it's exciting for other people, I guess, but yeah. I've been doing it for so long. It's like, yeah, okay. It's a job. Yeah. It's, it's, it's the a norm. job. It's the, the norm. norm for you. Yeah. 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 So, but yeah, talk, going into a big party. No, man. If I have to do a, uh, you'll a go speech. Do a, you'll go do a 13 mile run instead of going to the party. Yeah. That like before coming here, I, I, I paddled 10 miles. <laughs> I did. It was like, <laughs> oh man, okay, this is okay. I can do this. Well, that's but. it, right? It's like, that's where our edge is, right? We might find it. it's not <clears throat> physically comfortable to go do some of those things, but that's where we emotionally, we may feel more comfortable to do those, to go do this. It's different for everybody, right? But our edge might be, oh, having this conversation. Shit, I'd rather go spend the morning grueling, you know, dr- grinding it out in the, in the, in the boat instead of dealing with the people or whatever. Like I've got my versions of that too. Yeah. Right. And, yeah. um, but the, the thing of it is on, sure. I would love to be able to bring a lot of those things in to other aspects of my life. Right. But I also go, I try to keep the stress level fairly low yeah. in my life. Yeah. So why should I subject myself <laughs> to that? Well, that's so amazing, right? Because you're the guy that's like, this is what I find fascinating. We all do this, right? I'm not, this is why I just love this about human nature, right? Which is I'll go push myself over here and somebody might be like, Jesus, you know, why is this guy grinding it like this? Like you, the, the list of things you talked about doing in your, as you were recovering your heart, right? That's grueling to do that seven mile run in the sand. Like if you told me I was doing that tomorrow, I'd be like, I'd be up all night. Like, God damn it. I'm not doing that. I'm do it. And you're like, cool, let's go do a seven mile run in the sand. But like that, you know, but where the stress comes in is different for everybody. That, that place where it's like, oh, this part, oh, that's, that's difficult for me. I might rather go do this other thing. So we can, it's, it's I think it's fascinating because we can easily project on other people. If he's able to do that amazing thing over here, he must have it all figured out. And I'm not saying that about you in particular, but it's what's what we do. It's just easy to look at people and just say, oh, across the board, they have that level of success instead of seeing it as like these peaks and valleys, like, oh, he's really good at that thing, but he might be complete shit at his finances or, you know, at a relationship or whatever it might be for whatever's challenging for that guy. Does that make sense? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, but, you know, now I'm, you know, I'm 60. I'm going to turn 61 next month. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm finding that it's okay to say no, it's okay to, you know, before be why, why was person. it, why wasn't it okay to say, no, I just, I want to learn from you. Yeah. Like, yeah. What was it? I, what, I think it, it's, you know, sometimes you feel like you have to be everything for everybody. Okay. The expectations. I gotta, yeah. meet, I gotta meet expectations. And, um, that, I, that's just not who I am. And the thing of it is with the heart attack, it changed me and I would not go back and change things to not have the heart attack. I think it's made me a a better person. Uh I understand things so much more and can see where people are coming from with their issues and, and their problems. Um, and it's, it's allowed me to just take a step back and, and really enjoy those sunrises. Not sweat the small shit like other people's Absolutely. expectations and yeah. Yeah. Just let it go. And people are going to get mad at you. I go, okay. Yeah. Tough. You know, it's, it's fine. Okay. Yeah. I I'm appreciating that. Cause I think that, that it takes a perspective that includes, our mortality to give ourselves permission to drop the small stuff, right? When we zoom out and we see our life as a whole, instead of, I just got to get through this thing and I just got to get through the next thing. And we're in this kind of firefighting mode. When we, when we zoom out and we see our life as a whole, as you must have been, you know, that event does You're like, Oh my God, we're talking about my life today. Not like what I'm going to need to pick up at the grocery store on the way home. 
I'm now in a completely different perspective of looking at my life. I think it's when we, we are able to give ourselves a sense of perspective and a sense of permission to say, I don't have to sweat the small shit anymore. I don't have to. And it doesn't mean that you don't still get stressed out from time to time, but I, I think that that's what I'm imagining. Is that fit? Yeah, absolutely. The number one thing is to just, just be yourself. Don't try to be anything else. Because once you do that and you feel comfortable in your own skin, nothing's going to stop you mm-hmm. because you know who you are. And, and it's taken me, you know, up until a heart attack and time after that to sit back and go, just be you. Embrace who you are. Yeah, I love that. I, I, that the whole pressure of trying to meet expectations is such a drag. And I love this message of just have the guts to be you. That's the it, it's gutsy. It's real gutsy work to, to to simply be who we are. Own what has us feel free. Own what has us feel alive and at peace and 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 love and connection with others. And that's that's hard work if if we've shaped ourselves to be who others want us to be or who we think we should be. That ideal in our mind. It's really challenging. It is. Yeah. It is. And. I'm happy now in a lot of ways that I never was. I'm I'm at peace with so many things. Oh, do I have bad days? Absolutely, yeah. you know. But the um, the pure joy of waking up in the morning, it, th- there's a lot there. Yeah, you know. You open your eyes, you're going, all right, here we go again. <laughs> <laughs> If these interviews are helping you, then please visit The New Man on iTunes and leave us a positive review so others can discover the show more easily. Thanks for listening.